Greetings again to you, the viewers, who I assume to be um, grade 12 English first edition language learners, or as I prefer to call you, students. This is the second part in a series of lessons which are intended to raise your marks through mainly logic, common sense, and possibly a few items of knowledge which you did not have before. We are today, in this session, dealing with advanced essay writing. Remember that in our first session, we did a paper three and essay writing in general, selection of topics, planning, all that sort of thing. Today, though, in this um, lesson, we are again looking at advanced essay writing, but basically we are now going to try to eliminate the more common errors that we pick up. Now, you will notice there that I've written handwriting, write legibly with a blue medium point pen. Well, I must be quite honest, you are allowed to use a black one. But please, can you make sure that we, the markers, can understand what you've written. In many instances, the essays that we read seem to be something like that. Now, I don't know if you can understand this, but I can't. So what I'm going to do is use this clever computer to work out what is, in fact, written there. And it is as follows. I'm sure you can read that. If the marker has to go to an optometrist after attempting to read your work, it is unlikely that your results will be good. All right. So the first thing you must please do is ensure that you have a legible handwriting. You notice I've put here, write legibly. Legibly means it can be read. I myself do not have a neat handwriting, but it is legible. Very few people struggle to read what I have written when I use my own handwriting. Now, the first thing I want to do in this session is to look at how an essay is marked. Here, you will see, is the rubric that is used. This is one of the latest ones. First, we look at content. Now, there you see content and planning. I like planning. I don't like drafts, okay? But the planning always has an effect on the content, whether it's good or bad. And you will see, though, that the content is out of 30 marks. Then we have language style and editing out of 15 marks. And I'm sorry that the rubric is sort of split through the middle here, because it does make it irritating, but don't worry, it is the correct rubric. And finally, we have here structure out of five marks. Now, it may interest you to know that structure and content is very closely related. The two overlap by more than half. So in actual fact, your content and your structure combined give you 35 marks out of the possible 50 for your essay, which means only 15 marks is allocated for language. I want to stress this because even if your language is not wonderful, and I don't expect it to be wonderful because you are not an English home language speaker, even if your language is off, you can still get a distinction for your essay. Please, I assure you, it is possible. Right, and this is why. Let's take a look at the exceptional category for content. Let's take a look here. First, what is being assessed in your content and planning? Uh, it's response and ideas. Uh, please note ideas. Organization of ideas. Oh, you see how this computer is set onto American spelling. 
That is not a spelling error, by the way. But uh, the computer keeps trying to change the S into a Z. Um, in South Africa, we use British English, and we use I-S-E, not I-Z-E. Okay. Organization of ideas for planning. Awareness of purpose, audience, and context. In other words, you are addressing the topic. Now, let's take a look here at the very best content mark that you can achieve. It says here, outstanding striking response beyond normal expectations. All right, that's fairly obvious. Intelligent, thought-provoking, and mature ideas. In other words, no generalizations, um, no silly statements which aren't true, stuff like that. Exceptionally well-organized and coherent. Okay, organization. Now, that's where I say the content mark overlaps with the structure mark because that is the structure of the essay. Exceptionally well-organized and coherent or connected, including introduction, body, and conclusion or ending. I just call it conclusion. Right. Now, it is for that that you must aim. That is what you must try to achieve, is to get an essay where the description matches that. And I hope you're taking note here. Right. Um, there are various other um, categories here, you'll see. Um, let's just go down to the next one down. Excellent response, but lacks the exceptionally striking qualities of the outstanding essay. All right. Uh, it's the X factor. That's the only way I can describe it. There's just something about a, a brilliant essay. And we pick up on it when we mark them. It's just that particular something which sets an essay above the others. I really hope that you get that sort of essay coming out of your pen when you are sitting in November in the exam hall and producing this work. We'll take a look at a few other items on this rubric. Things to avoid. All right, let's go down. Here's our moderate category. Okay, bottom area of moderate. Satisfactory response, but some lapses in clarity. This is where your language ability does come into play. Your essay must be clear above all things. Um, even if there are language errors, they must not affect the meaning. As long as the meaning is clear, um, you can still get a fantastic mark. But as soon as the meaning starts to become blurred, um, you're going to lose out badly. Because then it goes down, you see this is already in the moderate category, and it can get a lot worse. Right? Let's take a look here. Ideas are fairly coherent and convincing. Okay? Some degree of organization and coherence, including introduction, body, and conclusion. Even at that point, you must have an introduction, the paragraphs forming the body, and a logical conclusion. All right. Then we start going down to the elementary categories. Take a look here. Um, inconsistently coherent. That's where things go wrong. Is the, there is coherence in the essay, but it's not there all the time. Unclear ideas. Oops, we can't understand the whole essay. And unoriginal. Now, originality is something for which you must strive. It must be different. It must not be something which is too obvious, and it must definitely not be something which the chances are I have encountered before. Okay? And so it goes on. Irrelevant. Ooh, this one's a deadly category to fall into. Irrelevant response. This is why you must pick your topic so carefully. You must make sure that you plan correctly so that you ensure that you are addressing the topic. If you go off topic, you've had it. Okay? Ideas tend to be disconnected and confusing. Um, this is, of course, when your English language abilities are so bad 
that you simply can't express yourself clearly. All right? Uh, hardly any evidence of organization and coherence. Okay, so it's not coherent, it doesn't flow. It's all about flow. Um, an essay that flows nicely is such a pleasure to read. I assure you, we don't mind language errors. We're going to encounter language errors in every essay, more or less. But as long as those errors don't stop the flow, it's like driving a car, you're cruising nicely along the, the N1 at 120, and then suddenly you've got a truck in front of you and you can't swing out into the, the passing lane and you, clunk, you've got to hit brakes. The flow of your travel has been interrupted. It's the same thing with an essay. There mustn't be anything to interrupt the flow. Okay, we won't go through every category here now, but really, you can see here, strive to achieve the required um, elements of the exceptional essay. Here they are. Look at them. Check them for yourself. You've got the video, now you can see them. Let's go down then to language style and editing. Okay, I'll see if I can get them all onto the screen. Yes, there we go. Language style and editing. You see you've got the there and there. Um, now here, obviously, is what you are going to try to achieve. Tone, please note that the tone, very important. Register, the degree of formality. Style, everybody has their own writing style. And vocabulary, your word choice. Try to build up a good vocabulary of higher level words that you can use in an essay. Um, highly appropriate to purpose, uh, audience, and context. All right. It must be appropriate to the essay you've chosen, the topic you've chosen. Language confident, exceptionally impressive. Well, if you can get that, I'll be very pleased. All right. But notice the key word there, confident. Um, you must be confident when you write. Sure, you're going to make mistakes. That's not the point. The point is, there must be, you must write uh, so that you know what you want to say. Compelling and rhetorically effective in tone. It must be a convincing essay. It must be an essay which holds attention. It starts with the introduction, basically. And it must grab your attention and take you all the way through to an excellent conclusion, all right? Um, and is that language good when it comes to doing that? Now, here we have virtually error-free in grammar and spelling. Very skillfully crafted. It doesn't say completely free of errors. Even at home language level, we never get essays that are completely free of errors. That just doesn't happen. Okay, this one stresses virtually error-free. Okay, so the fewer the errors, the better, obviously. But don't worry if you think you've made one or two. It's not going to knock you out of the exceptional category. Now, um, the second, the, the lower level of the exceptional, there you can see it for yourself. Language excellent and rhetorically effective in tone. Virtually error-free in grammar and spelling, skillfully crafted. Right. Now, let's take a look at what can go wrong. Right? We'll go to the middle category here. Tone register and style vocabulary appropriate to purpose, audience, and context. Okay. Appropriate use of language to convey meaning. Yes. Tone is appropriate. Rhetorical devices used to enhance content. Note that. Rhetorical devices, figures of speech. Um, things such as rhetorical questions. If you're doing an argumentative essay, rhetorical questions can be fantastically effective. Okay? So use figures of speech wherever you can. Okay? And here, um, the lower category, adequate use of language with some inconsistencies, tone generally appropriate, and limited use of rhetorical devices. You see that? Um, we like to see figures of speech, rhetorical devices, basically uh, um, good use of language 
in an essay. And then, of course, we go down to the not very successful categories. You see here, tone register, style, and vocabulary, not appropriate to purpose, audience, and context. This is where things go wrong. Very basic use of language. Tone and diction are inappropriate. Uh, limited vocabulary. Okay, we won't go down any lower. It's on the screen. You can see it for yourself. But try, when you are writing your essay, to keep this rubric in mind. Now, finally, we have the structure. It's only out of five marks, this. And it's so closely um, overlapped with the content mark. Well, you'll see. It talks about development of, well, it talks about coherence. Excellent development of topic. Yes, topic is, starts with an introduction, finishes with a conclusion, and it's a logical flow all the way in the middle. Exceptional detail. Detail makes a difference. And then sentences and paragraphs are exceptionally well constructed. Oh, I see they've made a, they've eliminated the ED there, but never mind. You can see the whole um, moral of this structure story. And going down to where the structure wipes out, some valid points, sentences and paragraphs are faulty, all right? But essay still makes some sense. Okay. So there you have it. Content, language, and structure. That is how your essay is going to be marked. Now let's move on. We're going to leave this rubric for now. And we're going to take a look at advanced essay writing. Basically, what I've done in this um, presentation is to take note of many of the errors that were picked up by the internal moderator who then writes out a report. And these are the main ones. We've got three categories. It's format, it's content, and then it's language and spelling and that sort of thing. General uh, uh, common errors which we tend to encounter. Let's start then with the format-related tips. And as we said in the previous lesson, clearly indicate your planning. There is nothing more frustrating than being unable to work out where the planning stops and where the uh, essay itself begins. You must indicate your planning. Next, this is from me. In order to make point number one easier, your planning should be on a page by itself. And there's no overlap between planning and the start of the essay. Please bear that in mind. Use a page. We mentioned this in the last lesson. Your exam book has 24 pages. Don't be shy to use three of those 24 for the planning of the essay and your longer transactional and your shorter transactional. Each one of those gets a full page. Even if you only use five lines on the page, it doesn't matter. Keep the planning separate from the product which is going to be assessed. Now, the next point is do not duplicate your planning. Planning is done once only. It shocks me how many people do planning and a draft and then planning again and the final copy. Why? Planning comes before everything else. Why do you have to plan a second time? Other people will do a mind map followed by paragraph by paragraph planning, followed by a draft. It's unnecessary. You don't have to do that. Don't waste your time. Planning is done once, and then you carry on, and you, if you want to do a draft, do so, although it's not necessary. Um, but otherwise, you do the planning, and you carry on straight away with your final neat copy. Let's move on here. Now... Clearly indicate where your final neat copy begins. This drives me mad every year. When we're marking the essays, and you've gone through this essay in detail, you've read it for content, we do it, we're supposed to go through the essay twice. Um, the first time for 
to assess a content mark, and then, of course, the second time we go for the language and the structure and all that sort of thing. But what happens? You finally go through and you check your rubric very carefully and you look at your descriptors and you say, right, that essay is worthy of these three marks, contents, language, and structure, and you fill it in and you say, right, now I can carry on. You turn over to mark the, um, the longer transactional, and what do you find? You find that you've marked the draft. And it's not indicated that it was the draft. It's not, in, you know, and then suddenly you have to do the whole lot over again. Then all of that work that you've done, you chuck it out, and now you start the marking again of the final neat copy. So indicate, final neat copy, indicate, draft, indicate planning. And just a reminder that it is not a requirement to do a draft. We said this in the previous session. If, as I am, you are a slow writer, a draft can possibly cost you the time required to do your, for example, your shorter transactional piece. Be careful about that. Then, ensure that both the topic number and title are written above both the planning and the essay. Very important. Okay, sometimes the marker has to go flip, 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 flip to try to work out what is being marked. We don't know sometimes. And we've got to search through this paper all over the place. So please make sure that you put all the required information onto planning and essay. Essays should not contain subheadings. Please take note of that. Sometimes people feel the need to include subheadings, especially if they're doing a discursive or an argumentative essay, but don't do it. Subheadings ruin the coherence. It, it provides a stop, a jerk, a pause, and your coherence is already out the window, and your essay will, is already dropped to moderate at the most. Okay? Please be careful about that. No subheadings in an essay. Only the title, the official heading. Now... An essay should consist of, and I know this is obvious, but bear with me, an introductory paragraph, the paragraphs forming the body, and a concluding paragraph. That is how good structure works. It's simple and straightforward, but it stands true. Then, always do a word count. I'm stressing word count. If you go below 250 words, or beyond 300 words, you are going to be heavily penalized. The worst mistake you can make is to go beyond 300 words because certainly up till recently, the instruction to the marker was count to 300 words and cross out the rest. Now, if that happens, you lose your conclusion or you lose at least part of your conclusion. So please, please, please do the word count. It's not for the marker, it's for you to ensure that you have stayed within limits, okay? Bear that in mind. It is recommended that as you are writing the essay, you count words paragraph by paragraph uh, in order to ensure that in your final paragraph you don't go over the limit, all right? And you can squeeze into the, um, the final paragraph for everything that you meant to say. Please take note of that. Do a word count. Right, let's go on to content. And I'm deliberately delaying by a second or two because I know certain people are going to be hitting the pause button and writing down the eight points that are here. That's fine. Okay, now continuing. Content-related tips. Now, people, you know, there's a saying among the Formula One drivers. You cannot win a race on the first lap, but you can lose it. And that is very true of essay writing. The content, the selection of your title is absolutely critical. Let's take a look here then. The first thing I've written, select your topic carefully. I've seen some absolutely excellent essays which in fact scored a terrible content mark. The person did not understand what the topic was that was being addressed. 
And even though the essay was you know, coherent and the diction was good and everything like that, um, the topic selected was simply the wrong one for that particular writer. Please take note of that. When you are sitting down to write your final English paper three, you are going to be given 15 minutes before you write to go through the paper. You know how these exams work, man. You're going to pitch up um, at your exam hall before 8.30. At 8.30, you enter into the hall. The, the exam instructions are read. The answer books are handed out. You put your information on the answer books. And then what comes next? At 15 minutes before 9 o'clock, the question papers are handed out. You have 15 minutes to go through the question paper before you are even allowed to start writing. Use those 15 minutes to select your topics. And please select the topics with care. Select carefully, in particular, your essay topic. Make sure that you understand what is required of you when you write that topic. Because if you don't, you're going to make a terrible blunder. No matter how well written your essay is, if you haven't selected your topic and addressed it, you've had it. So remember, take the wise words of the Formula One drivers and make sure that you set off on your race correctly on your first lap. Don't blow it in the beginning. Right, let's move on here. Plan fully and effectively. Now, in our previous session, um, we looked at a method of planning, and it was full and effective. Remember the test of planning? Can you hand your planning to me and ask me to write the essay on your behalf? That is effective planning. Now, stick to the topic. Do not wander off topic. Many times I see essays that begin brilliantly and the introduction is so well constructed on topic and then comes paragraph two and it starts to slide away from the topic. By paragraph three, the, the topic is lost completely and the rest of the essay winds up with a terrible content mark. And the whole secret to staying on topic is to plan correctly. If you plan correctly with that title above you as you're planning, you cannot go off topic, I assure you. Now, do not repeat content in your essay. In particular, do not repeat the title. Um, I've read, marked many essays in which every paragraph starts with the title. It's annoying. It's repetitive. It drives me mad. And the content mark suffers accordingly. That will never produce a good content mark if you keep repeating the same topic. Okay? The content must be factually accurate. No. Nelson Mandela was not born in 1994. That was one of the <laughs> worst ones that I encountered. All right? Um, no. The fastest car in the world is not a Ford Cortina, I assure you. It must be factually accurate. We, the markers, have read a lot. And we know a lot, we have a lot of general knowledge. And we know when something is going off topic, right? Or we know when a statement being made is false. Please make sure that everything you write is factually correct, OK? The content must be logical, yes, and credible, believable. Um, if you are writing a narrative essay, or if you are writing a creative story, um, which is fictional, there's nothing wrong with that. But don't write it in such a way that it's silly and is obviously impossible. That is what credible is. It's believable. Incredible is something that can't be believed. Now, on occasions, I have also seen people who were uh, very deliberately um, writing a, <coughs> sorry about that. I've seen people who were writing amusing stories. They were using hyperbole, you know, gross over-exaggeration to provide a funny effect. 
and it worked. In that case, you didn't expect it to be credible. It was done for effect. So <clears throat> that's OK. But if you are trying to write a story uh, which you want to be believed as is, please make sure that it is possible to believe it as is. Good? Now, both your introduction and your conclusion must be effective and original. Very important. Effective, yes, and original. Try as far as possible to present the marker with something new and different. We don't want the same introductions every time. And the conclusions. Oh, that was a day that I will never forget in my life as long as I live. I've read that one far too many times. Please don't give me something silly like that. Okay? Also, it's pre-prepared content, that. And that also hammers your content mark. Now, <clears throat> lunch bar. No lunch bar or obvious content, please. I mean, my favorite one that I encountered, and there I've put it there. I was born as a child of two parents. Yeah, gee, wow, that is so profound. <laughs> yes, I know. Tell me something that I don't know. And then we as human beings. You know, honestly, the fact that you are in grade 12 and you are sitting in an exam hall and writing an essay leads me to suspect that you are indeed a human being. You don't have to tell me. <laughs> Further content-related tips. Uh, here's the one that drives me mad. Do not fluff out your essay with pre-prepared content. And there I've given you that same one as an example. That was a day that I will never forget in my whole life as long as I live. There, I've just increased my content by 14 words or whatever it is. Don't do that. It is the death sentence for a good mark. Is when you wipe out with an appalling conclusion or as we call it, pre-prepared content, which you, you, you try to slip it in anyway. Okay, now here, very important. We looked at this in the last session also. Do not include any non-English words or phrases. So many times, my guys do this. Um, I'm teaching at a school, which is Susutu Home Language. And often... I encounter words of Susutu slipped into their essays. Now, the fact that these words are regularly used in their English language doesn't matter. The point is, it's not supposed to be in an English language essay. Watch out for that, all right? I mean, sometimes I've had whole sentences in Susutu. Okay, it's, it's in quotation marks, etc., etc. But the point is, it's not English. You are writing in English. Use only English words words. Then, cliches. We hate cliches. Cliches are overused phrases. And here, oi, oi, oi. Education is the key to success. Thank you, I know that already. Please don't put that into your essays. I'm so tired of reading that. It is not profound. It is not clever. It is simply boring. I've been reading that for 20 years already. A wise man once said, and I quote, oh, it annoys me that for two reasons. Firstly, it's a cliche. And secondly, why can't you just say something like, Nelson Mandela said that? Then you've cut out a few words as well. You've chopped some tautology. Okay? If you are going to quote a wise man, I want to know who the wise man is, please. And then we, the youth of this country, oi, oi, oi. I know you're the youth of the country. Don't keep reminding me, please. Okay, cliches, uh-uh. And then this one, again, just a reminder. Never exceed the word limit. Okay? And I've, I've added some tautology there on purpose. This is repetition. <coughs> Don't exceed the word limit for any reason whatsoever, ever at all. Okay, that's it. Don't go past the word limit. You are killing your own results. Good. That's content. Let's move on now to our various other grammatical elements. Grammar, punctuation, and diction. Here is a very useful list for you. Now, punctuation 
is used to clarify meaning. And we are going to look at punctuation in one of our next sessions. Always use basic punctuation correctly. Now, your basic punctuation, capital letters, full stops, and commas. Is it too much to ask that you master just the use of those three punctuation elements? With those three, capital letters, full stops, and commas, as long as you know how to use those three, you can produce a coherent essay which is correctly punctuated. And remember, punctuation clarifies meaning. There's a reason for this. If you are looking at me now, you are not just listening to my voice. You are watching my facial expression. You are watching the gestures that I'm making with my hands. You are watching how I'm maneuvering my body. And you are also listening to how my voice alters in tone and uh, basically note. All of this is giving you other clues as to what I'm saying. But when you are writing something down, or when you are reading something that has been written down, all the visual and audio clues are gone. Then you have to use punctuation to explain more clearly the point that you are trying to make. So punctuation is critically important to clarify meaning. And of all the punctuation, capital letters, full stops, and commas are the most important. Now, upper lower case confusion. This is very common as a result of cell phones. When you are sending a WhatsApp message, um, almost nobody sends SMSs anymore. Nowadays, it's all WhatsApp or I can't remember all the other social media thingies, Facebook. You don't worry about correct uh, use of capitals. Okay? But it does matter in an essay. If you were to write, and now I'm going to switch to this document camera just to prove a point. Give me a second here, please. Um, there we are. Here is my first name. Look. Right, and now I'm going to actually write with my own hand. Good. And what is my name? It is Timothy. Can you see what's wrong with that? A proper noun must be spelt with a capital letter. So let me prove a point here. Okay? That's wrong. It must have a capital letter. Now it is correctly spelt. Can you see that? If a capital letter is required and not used, it's a spelling error. In the same way, if a capital letter is not required and it is used, it's a spelling error. And if your essay is full of capital letters in the middle of a sentence where they do not belong, it's going to damage your language mark. It might possibly cause some content confusion. So please be very careful about that. If you're not meant to use a capital letter, don't use it. OK, next. Do not mix up pronouns. OK, now the classic mixture is one, you, and they. Because all the teachers tell you that the correct pronoun to use when you don't want to be specific is one, which is correct. But what I tell my guys is, don't use the pronoun one. I've never seen it correctly used in an essay. I've only seen it cause confusion. Um, you know, they'll say something like, uh, if one supports soccer, then you should go to the stadium where they can enjoy the match. Aye, aye, aye. They, it's, it's such a scramble where you've got three different pronouns being used for the same person. Don't do it. Please, just don't do it. It is advisable. I know that <coughs> in technically correct English, you are supposed to use the pronoun one. But my advice to you is don't ever use it. 
Finished. End of story. It causes pronoun confusion. Now, he slash she. Ugh! Horrible, horrible, horrible. Causes a jerk in your coherence. Okay? If the gender is not specified, then use the masculine form, he. The teacher was angry because he noticed a disturbance in the back of the class. If there's no way of knowing whether the teacher is male or female, it's he, automatically. All right? Don't ever put he stroke she. It doesn't work. English is, shall we say, slightly... Um, uh, sexist in this regard is that when in doubt, make it into male. And here comes the indecision mark. The oblique slash. Um, <laughs> I come across this. Um, the person was angry, stroke, irate. I, 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 I. If you don't know what you want to say, how do you expect me to know what you want to say? The oblique slash should not ever be used in an essay. It has its uses, but they are very useful in, shall we say, um, email addresses, not in essays, because it merely shows that you don't know what you are, you are uncertain about what to write. And remember, oblique slash is the indecision mark. It is a dead giveaway that you are nervous, you are not writing confidently, you're not too sure which word to use. So what do you do? You wipe out. Okay, no oblique slashes in an essay. Now, this one is slightly funny, but avoid where you can. Avoid using the second person, you. Essays are written in the first or the third person. A narrative essay, first person, usually. Um, most other essays, you know, dis um, descriptive, um, uh, argumentative, all these, uh, it's going to be mainly in the third person. You won't use I. Well, in an argumentative essay, you can say something like, I think that. Sure, you can use it there. But um, you, if you use the word you, you are in fact addressing the marker. And markers don't like to be addressed. We are private people. We're not trying to enter into a conversation with you. We are assessing a piece of writing that you have produced. Please bear that in mind. All right, moving on here and the next one. Watch out for this, the double subject. My sister, she is a nurse. Oops. No, in English we don't do that. Now I know that um, probably the majority of you watching this are Susutu home language speakers and of course, in Susutu, this is correct language. But it's not correct in English. In English, it must simply be, my sister is a nurse. That's it. There, you've got your um, correct form there. Because in the, the first sentence, you've got two subjects. My sister and she. All right. We just don't do that ever in English. Now here is, once again, one of these common spelling errors that is, has evolved due to the use of texting. The pronoun I is always written as a capital letter. It is such a silly error to make in grade 12, and yet every year I encounter this used over and over, lowercase pronoun I. It's wrong! It is a basic spelling error that should have been eliminated back in grade two. Even in grade two, you learn to write the pronoun I as a capital. Be careful of that. That really hammers your language mark because it is such a basic error to make. Now, prepositions. Now, this gets complicated. Um, prepositions are specific to various... Um, verbs, okay? And there we have an example here. Use prepositions correctly, I've written, they can completely change the meaning of a sentence if misused. Right. Now this example I took out of the movie Borat. If any of you haven't seen Borat yet, well, you're in for a treat, it's a lot of fun. Uh, but it is quite crude. Okay, now war on terror. 
Okay, that was Borat taking the mickey out of, I think it was George Bush. And he says, you know, uh, we want to assure you, Kazakhstan support George Bush war of terror. He deliberately mangled the preposition. Instead of saying war on terror, he said war of terror, which implies, of course, that the United States is conducting a terrorist war. <laughs> Very cleverly done. Now, there it's amusing. But if you foul up your prepositions while writing an essay, it can have amusing consequences. Unfortunately, it's going to damage your content because you're going to change the meaning of the content. Now, I want to show you something here. Uh, I'm not advertising so much as giving you correct advice. Two things. First, okay, now I'm going to the... Uh, good. Look here. That is a cell phone. It is a very, very useful research tool. When you are preparing for exams, and not just your English exams, any exams, I mean, your cell phone's got Google on it. Use the Google. Any smartphone nowadays is magnificent internet capability. Always, and we said this in our previous session, always teachers try to stop you using your cell phone in class, etc., etc. Now, they, in the past, they had a good reason to do that, and even to this day, they have a good reason to do that. But when, when you have a smartphone, and this one isn't even the latest model, this thing is an antique, but it's the most amazing research tool. And you can look up any aspect of language on this. So this is one of your first um, resources that you must use. Now... Here's the second one. If you're serious about your studies, get this book. This is the one that I use every day in the classroom. Um, some of the language notes that you're going to encounter lately are based on this book. Obviously, I haven't photocopied from it, and I haven't taken it word for word. I've adapted it for myself um, be because it becomes easier if you condense it. But... Let's just take a look here when we come to prepositions. Okay, let's see where we find it. number 21. Prepositions are on page 36, and we're going to look at this list now. And please note that I am correctly quoting, it is from um, the English Handbook and Study Guide by Beryl Lutron and Marcel Pincus. You are pleased not to photocopy from this, Go out and buy your own copy. It's well worth the money, I assure you. Okay, let's go to page 36 and take a look at our um, prepositions. Take a look here. Here are the prepositions that are specific. What's titled combinations. Okay? Adjectives. Afraid of. Proud of. Fond of. Different from. Very often I encounter in essays different to. That's wrong. It must be different from. Good at or good for. Bad at or bad for. Keen on. Ready for. Tired of. Opposed to. Scared of. Inspired by. Interested in. Satisfied with. Sorry about or sorry for. Okay. Here. Okay, that's adjectives and prepositions. Here's verbs and prepositions. And they're specific. I believe in, approve of, object to, okay, insist on, agree or disagree with, etc., etc., etc. You must know these prepositions, okay? And here, if we go across to this page, a massive list of prepositions, all right? Um, there, lots and lots of examples. I can't go through it all. But what I'm doing here is saying, get hold of this book. It is the most amazingly useful tool. And if you don't have the book, back to your smartphone. Use it. I'm sure you're going to find, oops, I've got this upside down. I'm sure you're going to find whatever information you need. Um, every time that I go onto Google with my voice commands, etc., etc., I get the answer to what I'm saying. All right? Please do the same. Use these excellent tools. Right. 
back to our PowerPoint here. And we move on now to articles. Articles, unfortunately, do not occur in every language. So they can be very confusing um, to a second language English speaker. Um, Russians, by the way, uh, for Russians, they normally omit their articles because in the Russian language, there is no such thing. So don't be ashamed if in your language you have no articles and you tend to omit them. It's fine. It's fine. It's a very common error that. But what you must try to do is to sort out when do you use articles. The only way to do that actually is to read a lot or to listen to a lot of English where articles get used. I mean, listening just simply to a news bulletin will give you um, a good guide to what's going on with articles. All right? So you must get used to using these. This is, unfortunately, the development of a set of habits. Language is a set of habits. When I'm speaking, I don't first, <coughs> excuse me, I don't first think about, hey, gee, I must now use an article, <coughs> and then I've got to use an adjective, and then I've got to use a, um, a noun, and then I've got to use a verb, and then I've got to use an adverb. No. We speak. It's like driving a car. Eventually, it becomes a set of habits. You don't think about putting the clutch in. You just do it. You don't think about changing up from third to fourth. You just do it. It becomes automatic. And this is the same thing with any language and the use of articles, the use of prepositions, these things. You must simply develop the habit. Okay, now, formal writing should not contain contractions. When I say should not, okay, contractions are often used. But let's just look at, and now we go back to our document camera here. Let's look at some contractions. Okay, when you are using contractions, there, are we on camera? Yes, here we go. Uh, let me simply write something here. Can't. Can you see the deliberate error that I've made? I must have there a contraction. Because can't is, in fact, a contraction of can not. Now, the apostrophe comes where a vowel has been omitted. Now, in this case, the vowel O has been omitted. So the contraction will come there. All right, so contractions, well, can't, won't, shouldn't is another good one. Let me just put um, shouldn't here. Shouldn't. You see that? I've included the little apostrophe there. Sorry, my handwriting, as you can see, is legible but not wonderful. And please note, shouldn't. It's written out in full, should not. You can see there that the apostrophe comes again where the letter O has been omitted there. All right? So where the vowel is gone, there comes the apostrophe. These are our contractions. And it can be very, very um, confusing at times. Try not to use contractions in your essays. Um, it's not considered to be an indicated error unless you foul up with the apostrophe. And very often, people mess up their use of apostrophe. So formal writing, don't chuck in contractions. Write the words out in full, please, for your own sake. OK, let's move on. <clears throat> if contractions are used, such as in direct speech, do not omit or misplace the apostrophe. Basically, it's what I've just shown you here. Make sure that you use an apostrophe and put it in the correct place. How many times I've seen people put it in the wrong place, I can't even say. But it's thousands of times. And you must therefore know the apostrophe always comes where the vowel has been omitted. But we'll go into technical details of language when we look at paper one. Now... Numbers under 21 are written as words, not numerals. 21 and above, no problem. Then you write it as numerals. All right. Uh, once again, let me go quickly back to our document camera. 
So this here, let's just say, in, a, in an essay, you've written 12. If in an essay, that is a language error. All right, it should be 12. Okay? However, once you've gone past 20, it doesn't apply. If you've written the number 35 using numerals in an essay, it is correct. You don't have to change that. All right. So just bear in mind your low numbers. Below 21 must be as words. Okay? Uh, once you've gone past that, then you can use numerals as I have done here. Let's go back. Now, um, we go on to this one, a particularly annoying error. Do not chop up words at the end of a line. If you run out of space, then cross out the partial word and begin it again on the line below. And, you know, in that regard, try not to do it with a hyphen. You can do it with a hyphen, but remember then it must come between syllable gaps. And very few people get that correct. So my only advice is, if you are coming to the end of a, a sentence, well, let's just give you a, um, an example, and I'm going to go back to our document camera. Uh, now I'm writing, and I'll say something like, um, da 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 uh, begin ning to talk about, and I'm going to say paraphrasing. Para -fra Oops, I've run out of space. You see that? Cross it out and start it then on the line below. Okay? Paraphrasing. There we are. And I'll use ellipsis to show that I haven't finished the lesson, the, the sentence. But please take note of that. This is not a language error. It is perfectly acceptable to cross something out in an exam. It is, however, a language error if you try to continue that word on the next line. It's just not going to work. You're going to wind up with two spelling errors, and possibly lost meaning. Please be careful about that. Don't chop up words at the end of a line. Cross it out, start the whole word again on the next line. That's the best way to do it. Good. We move on. Text speak. Do not use text speak. Um, uh, something like, well, once again, I think let's do an, whoops, let me just go back there. An example here. You've all seen text speak. Uh, you. Okay? Uh -uh. Red pen, please. It must be written as you. Y-O-U. Another one. Four. Uh -uh. It must be written as four. Okay. That's how it's done. Okay, so please don't get into the habit of using your text method uh, or your text method of expressing yourself in your essay. It leads to terrible confusions and errors. Okay, moving on there. The next thing is another thing that I often encounter on cell phones. And in fact, the, on this cell phone of mine, the predictive texting actually gives me these as options. That's why so many people are using them, okay? Gonna should be going to, wanna, want to, got to, got to. Those aren't English words. You're not supposed to be using them. Um, it may interest you to know that there is a book, one of my favorite books, in fact, in which they do use these, but that's because the guys are speaking English with an Italian accent. The book's name is The Godfather by Maria Puzo. And there they do use gonna and wanna and gotta. And that book, just bear in mind, was written shortly after World War II and made into a brilliant movie. But the whole thing there is, um, don't use those words 
in your essays. Now, English is a disjunctive language, which means that words are not usually joined together. There are exceptions. Okay, cell phone, for example. Nowadays, almost everybody writes cell phone as one word. But your typical errors here, a lot or next to, because that's how we say them. We don't separate them out, but they must be separated out. All right? Don't join words together, please. Here's the, one of the most common spelling errors that I encountered. Tavern. So often... I see it written as Tarvin. I, I drive around in Lesotho quite a lot, by the way, and it's very common as a spelling error actually written above the door of the tavern. You know, something like Castle Rock Tarvin. Oh, dear. Okay, please remember it's a spelling error. Elders are people who hold a specific position in churches and certain tribes. Senior citizens are termed the elderly. Please Remember that. Now, here we come to that suffix in British English, which we speak in South Africa. Um, the I-S-E suffix is used, not I-Z-E. There is a distinction about them. One comes from Latin, one comes from Greek, um, you know, stuff like that, or one's Scandinavian, something. I do know that people have told me, but there's a very simple rule there. Simply use I-S-E, not I-Z-E. The apostrophe is used to indicate possession or contraction, as we just saw, but never a plural. Apostrophe does not indicate plural. Remember that. A comma is not normally used before the conjunction because. There's a very simple reason for that. A comma is used to indicate a pause. And we do not normally, normally, we do not pause before saying, you know, um, I'm going to town because I need to buy books. We don't pause there when we're saying it, so we shouldn't pause there when we're writing it. Error. Here we are. I shall try and finish it today. Ah, uh -uh. Correction, I shall try to finish it today. All right? Uh, the one is a conjunction, the other is a preposition. Please, to use a conjunction there, the conjunction and is wrong. To is correct. Okay? We will be there soon. Here's an auxiliary verb error. We shall be there soon. Okay? In the first person, the future auxiliary verb is shall, not will. The words youth and plastic do not normally change when used in the plural form. Please bear that in mind. Uh, scholars in grade 12 are referred to as matrix, not matrix. And this drives me mad. These... <sighs> Peanuts, who think they're being cool by writing it as matrix. It's not cool. It is a spelling error. You are changing the word completely. The word's got a completely different meaning. Please don't do that. And for you, those schools out there who are writing matrix on the back of the matric uniforms, I'm cross with you. Whenever you are able to do so, avoid ending a sentence with a preposition. It's not always possible, but... If you can, avoid it. That's pretty high-tech language, that. But, well, see if you can. Now, this one. Do you see this word, whereby? Do not use the word, whereby. Do not use it in your speech. And in particular, do not use it in your writing. It's always used incorrectly. It always winds up as a language error. Do not use it for any reason whatsoever. Please, take my word for it, you'll mess it up. It is an English language word, but to this date, I have never encountered an essay where it has been correctly used. Never. Okay, primary, secondary, and tertiary are adjectives, and if you have an adjective, you must, it must describe a noun. So, to talk about, I attended primary in, wrong. It's primary school. Please take note of that. An adjective must always describe a noun. Okay, enough of those. Let me just go back there for one second. Um, those are your um, language tips. A few more tips just before we end off this particular session. Keys to a great essay. Now, this one really is important. 
the marker. Remember that your essay will be read and assessed by a person who would like to enjoy reading it. That's absolutely obvious. I mean, when, you, when you're sitting marking 600 essays at a shot, um, obviously, you're going to enjoy the session much more um, when you mark mainly good essays. Now, does the introduction grab the reader's attention? Very important. Um, as soon as we encounter a good introduction, it makes us go, bing, oh boy, I want to read this. Is the content fresh, original, different? Give us something new that we haven't encountered before. Okay, it mustn't be something that you know, can very obviously be used to address that topic. Does the content flow smoothly from sentence to sentence and from paragraph to paragraph? Once again, that's your coherence. And is the conclusion memorable? Does it round off the essay effectively? The best conclusion, obviously, is one with a little bit of humor and preferably an unexpected one. But not everybody will be able to achieve that. Now, sorry, let me go back there just for a second for those of you that are taking notes. There we are, keys to a great essay. It's logical, it's simple, stick to it. Good, moving on to final. Finally, a few hints from the markers. Okay, first, try to make us laugh. Honestly, we love to have something which is at least a little bit witty, or at least smile, a little bit of humor goes a long way to improving an essay. Now, that's the good. Now, here comes the bad. We are content with our spiritual lives. Do not preach to us about your religious beliefs. I have my own beliefs, and quite frankly, it's boring to me to hear about how you were walking down the road and how you got invited into a church, and now, you know, you, you're saved and uh, you've got your Lord and Savior and all that. I'm not, into, I'm not questioning your sincerity. I'm not questioning your faith. But it's a personal thing, faith. I don't want to hear about yours. Thank you very much. Now... The next one, I don't want to hear about your mission in life. We have our own goals in life. Do not persuade us to join you in your campaign to eradicate alcohol. That's, whoa, a lot of people. Please join me to make sure that alcohol is no longer sold in South Africa. No, I'm not going to, okay? I'm not, I'm not questioning your sincerity, but I've got no interest in that. I've got my own things in life on which I concentrate, mainly English for that matter, but I'm... I'm not interested. Okay, smoking. I don't smoke. I think it's a stupid habit. But I couldn't care less about your campaign to stop smoking, or teen pregnancy, or politicians, or cruelty to animals, or suicide bombs. Blah, 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 blah. Not interested. Okay? I don't want to take part in your campaigns. So as soon as you end off your um, essay with, you know, please join me in making it possible for, you know, um, uh, whatever, HIV, AIDS to be eliminated. No, I won't. Not interested. Boring. Now, and this one, please, please, please. We are older and more experienced than you. We do not want to read about the stupid, boring details of your sex life, so there. Leave sex out of your essays, okay? And I don't want to hear you boasting about how good you are at it. That drives me mad. People, there we are. We're stopping at this point in this second lesson. Um, just a reminder, this is how to write good essays. This is what it's all about. In this lesson, we looked first at the rubric used to mark the essay, and then we went on to look at format, content, and common errors, along with a few items of advice on how to get it right. I hope that you are going to apply what you learned today and I hope that your marks go up because of this. Thank you. I hope also that you are going to enjoy the next third lesson, which is also about paper three. See you shortly.